you know, stick to our permitted time slot, we'll make a start. So firstly, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for setting aside some of your time to join us in what we hope will be an interesting discussion about the concept of shelfware. This is a problem that, uh, to some degree at least, affects the majority of organisations that we work with or speak to. Um, so I'm sure it will resonate with many of you here today as well. Although we'll be talking about the concepts in general terms, there's going to be a slight emphasis on shelfware from an RM perspective and how it can be both a problem as well as an opportunity in terms of um, increasing your maturity level. We'll hopefully have a few minutes at the end to answer any questions that you may have on the topic. Uh, so please feel free to post those throughout the session using the Q&A function and we'll pick those up and uh, address as many of, the, of them as we can at the end. Before we head straight into the content, we'll begin with some brief introductions. So uh, my name is Mark Jackson. I'm the RM Practice Director for Turnkey UK. I've been with Turnkey for almost 15 years now, and I've got over 20 years experience supporting clients with regards to their security risk and controls related challenges. And that's in both a advisory and assurance capacity. I'm also pleased to be joined by my colleague, Asim Ahuja, who will be sharing some of his interesting insights on today's topic. So I'll hand over to Asim for a quick intro. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Asim was at this side, Managing Consultant, IRM. I have more than 10 plus years of experience in GRC transformation. I've worked with various tools, uh, SAP ServiceNow, and ha have also helped a number of external and internal audits as well. Looking forward for the session. Thank you. Thanks, Asim. So let's quickly set some expectations in terms of what we'll be covering during the session itself. Um, firstly, with the view of making this webinar accessible to all of you, regardless of your no level of knowledge uh, on the subject, we'll begin by explaining what shelfware is and how that uh, tends to originate within organisations. It's only when you're aware of this can you then begin to put in place uh, specific measures and strategies to avoid it in the future. We'll also be taking a look at ways in which you can identify shelfware within your organisation, as it may be that there's more unused or significantly underutilised software out there um, than you may think, and some of which could be the enabling technology that you're looking for to more effectively manage your business risks and internal controls. And this also touches upon the need to make better use of your existing software solutions in order to achieve a greater return on investment. And we'll help illustrate the importance of this point by taking a look at how some organizations having done exactly that are now receiving a greater ROI and, and increasing their IRM maturity at the same time. But next, let's start with uh, looking at what is shelfware? Well, it's a term that certainly conjures up images of software having been forgotten about and left on a shelf over time to collect and gather dust. And that's quite an accurate portrayal as the definition is not too dissimilar. As mentioned on the slide, this term refers to software that has been purchased by an organization but has never been used or is rarely used uh, and certainly not at the usage levels intended or expected. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to mean an entire software uh, platform or application though. This term is also applicable to a module or application bundled into a larger enterprise platform, which is not known about, or it's simply known about, but it's just not being utilized. It could also relate to a number of unused licenses, which also drive down the value of your software investment. So you need to manage your licenses to reduce the shelfware and get the most out of your license investment. Organizations need to know what's being used and how, and to continuously reevaluate uh, those license purchases. So, as you can see, shelfware can exist in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But how does this widespread problem uh, materialize in the first place? So, this cause and effect diagram um, that you can see helps to explain some of the main co contributory factors um, at play. The bigger boxes on the outside illustrate some key high level factors and the content in the middle provides some of the underlying details behind them. So let's start with looking at the one in the top left, which is software not required. Now you think it's pretty difficult feat to achieve, but this contributing factor is probably more widespread than you think. Some of the reasons why this can be the case is that the underlying business requirements were not clearly identified in the first place. So the software was purchased based on incomplete or incorrect uh, requirements. After all, software is procured to uh, serve a specific business uh, purpose. Um, so if it's not evident how it helps the organization, that will become redundant pretty quickly. However, it also might be um, due to the original requirements uh, changing over time. For example, a private company may become listed 
and this presents new regulatory requirements, particularly around, say, uh, demonstrating risk resilience um, and controls assurance, which means the incumbent IRM software is no longer able to keep pace with these evolving requirements. In addition, if there isn't a joined up and cohesive strategy between the different teams within the second line, then it is also being known that they go out and buy their own software independently, often with a lot of overlapping functionality and capabilities. So new software purchased can contribute to others turning into Shellfair. So next, let's look at the contributing factor in the top right, which is doesn't meet key requirements. Sometimes a company may uh, purchase software with high expectations only to realize later on that the software cannot meet their specific needs. And this can lead to the software being shelved. Now, this can happen due to a lack of research on the software's capabilities, um, potentially poor communication between departments regarding their must have requirements. So it's crucial that key requirements are gathered across all the main stakeholder groups and a, a thorough vendor selection process is followed. A poor implementation of the software itself can also lead to it not being uh, or not meeting, sorry, the key requirements. Now, if the implementation process is not handled properly, the software may not be configured correctly, leading to difficulties in its use. This can then cause frustration among the end users and disengagement and may result um, in the software being shelved. Now, if we look at the contributing factor in the bottom left, um, this is organizations not being ready to use it. So we're talking in a little more detail shortly about the RM maturity model and the different levels um, within it. But the fact of the matter is implementing technology alone isn't going to increase your maturity. In fact, there are prerequisite and fund foundational steps that need to be addressed first regarding people and processes. So if these aren't addressed beforehand, then the enabling technology won't have anything to enable. End user enablement or the lack of it in the context of training specifically is also something that can make or break whether an organization is ready to use this solution. Feelings of frustration and, and not understanding the why are not uncommon as well as a clear understanding over their roles and responsibilities. And this may mean that some end users choose to abandon it altogether. Uh, and lastly, we'll look at the contributing factor in the bottom right, which is hidden software. Now, again, it might sound difficult for a software application to be hidden, but this can be quite common, particularly when organizations have invested in enterprise level software platforms or GRC solutions from which there are a variety of modules and applications that can be switched on, so to speak. In addition, a lack of coordination and communication between the teams within the second line and perhaps even between the first and second lines themselves can mean that there is software being used to some extent, which may be beneficial to others, but they're just not aware of it. In summary, shelfware occurs um, when software is not being used by the purchaser due to a variety of the reasons. And those ones, the ones that we've just discussed are not the only ones, but they're some of the poor ones that we see. And there's obvious measures that can be applied to counter these reasons. However, despite best intentions, um, shelfware still tends to be a very real challenge for organizations. So it's important to know how you can turn this problem into an opportunity. Before, before then though, um, we're gonna pause for a couple of poll questions that should now appear for you to answer. The first one is, are you aware of GRC RM shelfware existing within your organization? So I'll pause for 20 or 30 seconds or so for you to provide your answer and then we can see what the results are. Okay, so that's interesting. It seems like uh, the vast majority are not aware of um, GRC uh, RM shelfware existing within their organization. Um, now, this may be because you're just unaware of it or, or you do have good good overview of that. So that's, that's an interesting one. And we could perhaps, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this a bit later on. Okay, so the um, the second poll question is, do you have shelfware from the following vendors? And again, I'll just give you pause there for sort of 20 or 30 seconds, give you an opportunity to um, answer that. Now, obviously, it sounds like a, quite a few of you don't have uh, or don't believe you have any shelfware. 
So we may not have many people respond to this one, but we'll just give it give it a few seconds. Okay, so it looks like we've got SAP and ServiceNow um, that's been flagged as, as um, vendors where this shelfware currently exists. Okay, interesting. Right, so the fact that organizations have shelfware doesn't need to be viewed solely as a problem. Um, it also presents a great opportunity for unlocking potential that is within your reach and quite often without additional license costs. As in many cases, um, you're already paying for them. So there's an immediate return on investment. So if we just move on to the next slide there, please, Asim. Thank you. Firstly, if you're not aware already, you need to know what shelfware exists within your organization. Um, and that's why that first poll was quite interesting because it may be that you're fully aware and there just isn't any at the moment, but um, this session may be of interest in case that does arise in the future or you're not aware. Um, and becoming aware, this can be achieved using various methods, including um, conducting an inventory of all the software and technology purchased, including licenses and subscriptions. And this can help identify which tools are being actively used and which aren't. Um, and your IT asset managers should be able to support that process. You can then research those that come up to understand if they can support any of your GRC use cases. Another more obvious and old school method is simply just having conversations with people. Go and speak to the enterprise risk team or go and speak to the internal audit team or whoever else might, might be relevant. Understand if they're using any supporting technologies to facilitate their processes. They can then show you what they're using and it may be that you're able to leverage the software capabilities, some which they may not even be using themselves, for your own purposes and benefits. Analyzing usage data is another useful mechanism. This, this obviously implies that it's software you're already aware of, but you're trying to understand whether it's being utilized optimally or not so don't forget we're not just shelfware isn't just about um, software that isn't being used at all but it's also software that's been underutilized many software tools offer usage analytics that can be uh, used to determine how frequently they are being used uh, and this data can help organizations identify tools that are not being used or only being used sporadically organizations can also review the terms of their contracts with software vendors to determine whether they're paying uh, for tools that they're not using or at least reducing, um, being able to reduce your license requirements if it's only a specific group of users that need to engage with the tool. Now, if usage is the main problem, then it would be a good idea uh, to understand why there is a lack of end user adoption, as there may be some simple steps you can take to address these challenges in order to gain more value from it. Organizations can survey the employees to determine which tools they use regularly and which they do not. And this can help identify tools that may be candidates for shelfware um, and these surveys can also target specific solutions you know are being underutilized in order to understand why and find the root cause of the problem. Uh, and then you've got potentially an opportunity to address those problems to, to, to make sure that you're, you're getting greater value from them. It would be a real shame if you had perfectly good existing software at your disposal or software that is hidden and unknown to you but would address your must-have requirements, but this potential just remained untapped. As I'm sure you're all already very familiar with, there are so many benefits of using enabling technology for managing risks and controls. So it's worth applying some of those methods discussed to try and dust off that shelfware and turn it into something positive and something of value. After all, nothing ventured and nothing gained, as they say. And at the very least, you confirm whether certain, certain shelfware can be classified as redundant and obsolete in order to remove them and the associated costs from your IT landscape. Now, before I hand over uh, the baton to Asim, I want to take the opportunity to introduce our IRM maturity model uh, and explain why it is relevant when discussing IRM related shelfware. This version uh, that you're seeing now is deliberately generic in nature in order to apply at a high level uh, to a number of IRM use cases, such as internal controls management, internal audit, um, enterprise risk management, et cetera, et cetera. We also have maturity models, which are use case specific also. Now, with any maturity model, the aim is to be obviously as far to the right as possible or as far to the right as necessary to meet the overall risk and control objectives of your organization. A lot of organizations we speak to tend to reside somewhere between one to three. So they're very much uh, on that journey. But the important part uh, point, sorry, is is knowing where you are on this model. Um, 
as this helps you to understand what's required in terms of next steps and improve your level of maturity. Now, we've helped organizations define strategies to do that. And a critical part of the strategy is understanding where they would like to get to and what would success look like for them over the next three to five years. Now, it needs to be realistic, though, and be aligned with the underlying culture of the organization, which might differ depending upon the industry within which it resides. Therefore, success might not be uh, attaining an optimized level of maturity. And, and most organizations we speak to, quite honestly, have no desire to achieve that. But understanding what you want to achieve and the characteristics you need to demonstrate from a people, process and technology perspective to achieve your target level is the key point here. Now, you might have noticed that uh, within the maturity model, the introduction of enabling technology doesn't come into play until level three, which is managed. And there's a good reason for that. Um, there's certain foundations, which we touched upon earlier, that need to be in place before your organization and the relevant end user community will be ready to embrace and adopt supporting applications and make it success. So if you can imagine an organization that barely has any formalized processes in place, the end users don't understand the importance of managing risk, and there's no roles and responsibilities in place for taking ownership over risk controls. Imagine trying to implement a GRC solution and just handing it over to them. They won't even understand the why, and so adoption will be extremely low as a result. And that's one of the causes we discussed earlier that can lead to a shelfware in the first place. So you need to take them on that journey with you. They have to be able to walk before they can run. So you need to really keep this in mind when looking to take advantage of shelfware within your organization. On the flip side, though, this maturity model helps you to visualize how making better use of RM shelfware can help you achieve your target maturity level, as enabling technology is a must uh, to obtain level three and beyond. So it will help you achieve greater internal alignment and integration between those functions responsible for managing risk, uh, have a truly kind of harmonized approach and, and greater workflow driven collaboration and real time risk uh, and control related insights and reporting at your fingertips. So this is why the RM maturity model is important as it helps you to understand when the right time would be to dust off that shelfware and any preceding steps that need to be accomplished beforehand but also how it can help propel you further towards your end goal. Now, the third and final poll uh, question is, where would you rate your organization within the IRM maturity model? Now, I appreciate you've only just um, seen, uh, seen it, but even after a quick glance, most organizations have a, a gut feel as to where they lie based on some of those key attributes, um, particularly if you're on the kind of lower maturity uh, level. So I'll pause again give you some time to answer and for us to see the results. Okay, we'll leave it there. So as, as you can see, I, I know there's only a few people um, participated, but there, it's coming within that one to three um, band, which I said before, we see most of our organizations in. So that's not uh, a surprise to us. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Asim, who will then take you through some uh, case studies. Um, so over to you, Asim. Thanks a lot, Mark. And uh, thanks for walking us through how shelter occurs. And we're going to discuss some of the live case studies that we have worked together in the past and currently turnkey is helping. So this way we can understand uh, from the live examples and you probably can relate how shelfware might be existing within your org organization. And in this example, we're taking UK's largest foods manufacturer, which is a FITC 250 LSE listed company and which has undergone a lot of major restructuring in the past and currently leveraging SAP ECC to manage their business. So as part of identification of shelfware, we were engaged and we, we saw that SAP access controls functionality was being underutilized to an extent. And some of the causes that Mark was discussing, uh, we also figured out that there was a lack of risk culture. There was definitely an adoption challenge and there was a lack of GRC strategy along with absence of second line of defense. Some of the uh, poll answers that we saw uh, were ranging from one to two on the maturity curve. 
So these could be similar causes where the GRC maturity is currently lacking. Uh, there, are, there were some pressing concerns on upcoming UK SOX and highlighted audit findings that the client needs to work, work against. And Turnkey helped them by creating a GRC strategy with the right access governance, governance models, starting with roles and limitation part, and also optimizing the existing underutilized SAP GRC access control. And to, to cater to the various use cases from internal controls management regarding UK SOX and audit recommendations which were there, we also worked with them to create a hybrid model where SAP and EGRC landscape can help uh, work together with the three lines of defense and digitize the risk controls and audit management that you're currently struggling with. So this is one example where we saw the maturity level uh, that, the that the current client was on one and we are going towards reaching up to the level four with them. Moving on uh, to the next case study that we have is one of the largest retailing company in the UK. It's a 50 100 company and leveraging SAP and ServiceNow and other best in breed technologies. And identification of shelf fare over here, we can see they got legacy ServiceNow GRC licensing that came as part of the enterprise solution. And they also have SAP GRC process control to manage uh, controls management, continuous control monitoring. So one of the major reasons this company was having shelf fare, again, bring, bring us to the very major point is the adoption and business enablement. At times, GRC tools comes with their own uh, technical knowledge where if, if clients and the process owners, control owners aren't being supportive, it can lead to adoption challenges. And there were multiple siloed tools, as Mark has earlier touched base that various tools in information security, using a different tool, enterprise risk. So, or there could be different department using various different GRC tools. Uh, that could create a, uh, problems in risk aggregation, control aggregation, uh, single source of truth that may come from the tool itself, and also reporting challenges. So these were the key identifiers that we discussed with them. And we showcase them, we can start with the proof of concept on ServiceNow GRC, where they can see it can be leveraged by different departments, various teams, the way they are structured across geographies, and they can have seamless interaction within the three lines of defense and create a unified enterprise risk view and uh, enhanced control testing measures. So this example, we can see the client was on the maturity level three, and we have taken them to four and working towards uh, the next level five. Uh, the third case study that we have, we're talking about a large financial services provider, which has under, which is currently undergoing security tool rationalization. They've got 20 individual security tools, which covers their state. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping tool functionality, a lot of redundancy, which is there. And the total cost of ownership of those tools is, is quite high. So for us, the identification of shelfware was to understand the security tool operational complexity, which is there, the large technical depth of managing those 20 security tools and reporting, uh, reporting challenges that comes with, with that. So with this, what Turnkey recommended was to review the security tool, which is there, where you can see a lot of overlaps and, and you can make use of uh, one tool rather than using 10 different ones. Uh, understand the underutilized functionality and processes that needs to be changed. And finally, once you have identified, completed that assessment, you probably can uh, uh, delimit some of the tools which may not be in use to, to an extent which is there. So this is another example where we can see maturity level three to four, we worked with the financial services provider. And underlying challenge of the technology GRC transformation that we are talking about, various factors that we have seen causing a shelf where brings us back to the target operating model, where you have 
people, process, technology, governance, and performance measures working together uh, with the right set of technology can provide the benefits that you have uh, listed as part of the business case for the GRC transformation. Having the right skill set, understanding how the project is currently going, delivered, managed after the implementation as well uh, is, is, a, is a key aspect. And having those target state processes defined that can be automated, digitized within the tool itself helps understand roles and responsibilities for people across various workflows. And then selecting the right technology and having the right service mandate with the right governance. Our uh, governance is a major part and it's not limited to just TACO. Uh, we need to have the right design authority for pushing any changes any to the production where you don't end up uh, with a bespoke customized tool that, that that's going to increase the technical debt and certainly uh, stick to most of the out of the box ways of working and also measuring the performance metrics which are there because if you cannot measure it you cannot manage it these are the underlying important aspects of the target operating model which which are there from the grc transformation perspective and there are certain critical success factors that can help you translate uh, your barriers into enablers one of them is deploying the right standards having the right taxonomies in place shared vision across three lines of defense where we can uh, get away with different teams, different departments using various silent tools. Embracing the risk culture. Uh, culture is being cultivated, takes a lot of time where people need to understand uh, why they're doing it, understand the bigger picture, and also uh, the complete vision, which, which is there from the rest standpoint. Uh, it may take a while uh, for organization and the people to understand because it takes its own time and you can see the complete uh, changes from uh, awareness to understanding to take the buy-in and finally ownership. Setting the tone at the top, getting the buy-in from the executives and the board is, is critical. And, and finally, uh, the last and the mo most major point, the GRC program transformation and ongoing has to be driven by the business and supported by IT. So these were some of the critical success factors, target operating model that we wanted to discuss, along with some live case studies uh, that we saw where the shelf fell, could occur, what are the various causes and how we can tackle those things. Uh, we'll pause here for a couple of questions. If you have any, please feel free to ask Mark and myself. Thanks, Asim. I've been monitoring the Q&A. We don't seem to have any open questions at the moment. Uh, we've, and we've got like a, perhaps a minute or two um, before we close the webinar. But just while we're waiting to see if any questions pop up, um, Asim, uh, I think some of your cases, they touch quite a lot on, um, it's interesting, a lot of them touched upon underutilization of, of uh, existing software rather than not having uh, the software in place. Uh, sorry, you're not having uh, the hidden software, uh, software that they're not aware of. Do you do you see though some cases whereby you're seeing some organisations that may have some big IT platforms in place and they're just not aware of the IRM related modules that exist and are a part of their um, licensing bundle uh, to be used as and where they see fit? Yep, yeah, uh, certainly, Mark. With the enterprise licensing, there's a lot of tools which are there that comes uh, and we can see from ServiceNow SAP side, a lot of these functionalities are there within the organization that they can make use of. Uh, it's about uh, getting in touch with your IT asset management team, understanding their licensing. And if you have a use case, you can definitely make use of existing licensing rather than uh, buy buying a new tool for that, so. Right, okay, thanks for seeing. Um, unfortunately, I think we have run out of time. There were no other Q, uh, questions coming up on the Q&A. Um, obviously, if anybody's got any questions they want to ask us um, after, after the uh, event itself, then feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll close after close the webinar at this point, but uh, you'll be able to access the webinar on, on demand shortly via our website, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, like I say, if you'd like to discuss any of the content covered today in further detail, then please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Asim. 
uh, our contact details are there for you. We'd be happy to help uh, provide Turnkey's insights and approach with regards to shelfware and, and you know, how you can turn that into an opportunity for increasing your iron maturity level. So what leaves me to say is thanks very much for joining and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.